Welcome to Computer Networks. This is Chapter 3, Part 3, the Transmission Control Protocol. So in this chapter, or this part of this chapter, we're going to take a pretty deep dive into the TCP protocol. And when we looked at UDP, we found that UDP was really quite simple. And we're going to see that TCP, because it is trying to offload a bunch of these tasks from the application layer is necessarily more complex. It provides more service. And to do that, it has to keep track of more state, it has to exchange more information. So the goal of TCP then is to provide some additional services. It provides reliability, guaranteeing that data either arrives or not and we'll know about it. If it doesn't, it makes sure that data arrives in the order that it was sent. So we'll see, for instance, that if I send 10 packets and they get rearranged by the network layer, that they'll be received and reordered and delivered into the application in the right order. It is error checked so that we know that the data that arrives passes this checksum, very much like what we saw with UDP. It is connection oriented. It allows me to open a connection and hold that connection open and know that the state of that connection is still established so that I can deliver new data to the receiver without having to reestablish this connection. Um, it has a built-in capability for congestion control to make sure that TCP data doesn't overwhelm any of the receiver or the uh, router or network links in between the sender and the receiver. It is full duplex. Opening up a TCP connection allows the client and the server to both be senders and receivers. So the client can send data to the server, the server can send data to the client uh, at the same time, actually. Well, not exactly at the same time, maybe. That, that's a different discussion. It gives the illusion of being full duplex. It is giving you the illusion that it's a point-to-point -point protocol, meaning I can directly talk to this remote server and that I'm the only thing talking to the remote server, even though that's not really true. And of course it is multiplexed, allowing multiple clients to talk to the same server, to allow the same server to run multiple server applications, having the clients having multiple TCP connections open at a time. And unfortunately, it does require this stateful TCP kernel, which we're gonna take a look at um, and it becomes a pretty, uh, like I said, it's a pretty deep dive into that. Uh, to sit down and try to write our own TCP kernel is, is not a, something that we're going to do lightly. Um, or do in this class, <laughs> to be totally honest with you. Um, the TCP kernel has to operate independently of the network activity. And so there's going to have to be some level of host OS support. Um, it's gonna require a certain amount of latency. So while the UDP allowed me to just send datagrams out over the wire um, with very little overhead, in the case of TCP, because it's got this congestion control and windowing system and it's got uh, ordering and all this other good stuff, there's a bunch of other data that gets exchanged in addition to the application data. And that necessarily adds latency and overhead. And TCP is vulnerable to attack. So we'll see that if I can spoof uh, this, this data, I can at least confuse the server. And more than likely, um, if I'm really careful, I could actually compromise a connection and, and take over the data um, just by filling in the source and port and stuff like that in exactly the right way. So we'll see some of the techniques used to, to limit this. So TCP needs to establish this persistent connection between two machines. Uh, we typically describe the machines as server and client. I don't mean to imply that these terms are describing the type of machine. It's just the relationship of the server opens up a connection to listen for incoming requests, the client, opens a connection to a server and establishes kind of an ongoing connection to the server. 
Um, and so it really is just depending on are you listening and then getting a connection or are you actively opening a connection to a server that is listening? That's all I'm trying to do in, in that definition. Um, the application on either side can read or write from that full duplex connection. So for example, when you are running a web server or a web browser over TCP, your web browser sends data, it writes data to the, the connection telling the web server, I am Internet Explorer or Chrome, I uh, want this URL. Um, and then the web browser, well, sorry, the web server reads that and it's like, oh, okay, I'll go fetch this data for you. And then it, it shovels the data back to the client all over the same socket. And so it's the same um, read and write. In fact, if we could tell that to the web server and do this ourselves, like there's nothing special um, about a web browser, except that it does a nice job displaying all those pretty pictures to us. TCP is going to read and write data from an application layer, and it's going to uh, spoon feed it or to or from the network layer. Uh, but the question is, how much? There has to be some upper limit. So you can kind of imagine if I have a big web page, let's say that web page has got um, 200K of data, big. And I can't just send 200K of data over the network wire all in one go. So instead, what's going to happen is there's going to be some memory on my server called a buffer that's going to hold some fraction of that web page. So as the, the program on the web server is reading the data from the hard drive and it's feeding it into the data buffer, Eventually that buffer is going to fill and that's going to kind of stop, that's my rendition of a stop sign. Um, it's going to stop the, the, the writer from writing any new data to the buffer. So it's going to fill this memory space. And, and then the TCP reader is going to try to read from application space and send it over to the network. How much can it do? Well, that's going to be determined kind of by the hardware of your machine. So what TCP is going to do is it's going to try to send all of this web page as packets, segments. Um, we're going to use the term segments. And TCP can read from the layer below, the network layer, and it can find this maximum segment size. And that's how much data the network layer can transmit at one time. Most likely that maximum segment size is determined by the next layer down, which is the link layer. And that's gonna be defined as the MTU, the maximum transmission unit. And going all the way back to the origins of Ethernet 2 in the 1980s, um, Ethernet is gonna have a 1500 byte frame. And all data gets kind of wrapped around an Ethernet frame. Uh, that's 1500 bytes of payload. So the MTU size is going to be 1,500. When TCP gets the value for the maximum segment size, however, there is already some overhead taken off. Um, we haven't talked about it, but we will in Chapter 4. The Internet Protocol adds a header around our message. And then, just like we saw with UDP, the TCP has a header, a little bit more detail a little bit more number of bytes in the header, that gets subtracted away from the MTU. And so we end up with the MSS being about 1,420 bytes. Now, it could be less than that if the TCP is a header has options. So we'll take a look at that header layout again coming up. But the idea is... Um, the TCP header is typically between 20 and 40 bytes, although it could be even a little bit bigger. So as a general average, we roll with about 1,400. So we'll say that the TCP can take 1,400 bytes of data at a time and send them out over the wire. So what will happen is TCP is going to read 1,400 bytes from this buffer, turn them into a packet, send them down the wire. Read another 1,400 bytes, 
send them down the wire. And as the TCP layer is reading from this buffer, more data can be written into it um, by the web server. And so eventually, we'll just chip away at this 200K buffer. We'll turn it into whatever 200K divided by 1400 bytes is number of packets, and we'll ship them off to the web browser or somewhere in the world. Question is, um, how big really is the maximum segment size? The problem is that every different device can use a different MTU, and it could be different all along the path between my computer and your computer. So for example, Ethernet 2 uses 1500 bytes, but um, asynchronous transfer mode or ATM networks, which are kind of common, we'll look at those later in the, the physical layer, those are often the fiber optic runs between uh, internet points. Um, they're using 53 bytes as their ATM cell size. And so one um, network packet from TCP can get turned into many different smaller units of data that then get reassembled later on. Reassembled by the physical layer, reassembled by the link layer, reassembled by the network layer, even maybe being reassembled by the TCP layer. So every TCP message gets headers, and what this turns into is overhead, right? So, um, so let's first of all talk about from one part of the problem, we could have some overhead just from the way that this thing gets written. So there's an IP header, and there's an Ethernet header, or an ATM header, so there's other stuff there. That, that overhead is not we're not going to discuss that yet. That's later in the semester. What I'm talking about right now is, let's say that the, we assume that the network layer can handle a whole TCP message, but to send a single byte requires at least 101 TCP bytes. Seriously, it's that inefficient. And if I'm going to transmit them over the ethernet, that one data byte is still going to occupy a full Ethernet frame of 1500 bytes. Ethernet, uh, as a simplification and, and kind of optimization, does not carve up the, the fraction of time. So a full frame is a frame, like a partial frame is still a frame, 1500 bytes. So sending 1400 data bytes means I put 1480 TCP bytes because of the headers and the IP headers and all that kind of good stuff still fits in 1500 bytes. Sending 1501 bytes means I'm going to send 1581 TCP bytes, but 3000 Ethernet bytes. So when we talk about overhead in the amount of data transfer, there's quite a lot of overhead. And that's just for the outgoing message. So we're going to see later on that this is the data going out, but then there's going to be a packet coming in that is an acknowledgement. It's really, unfortunately, very hard to quantify what the response is going to be. We're going to see that an acknowledgement can be small, or it can be piggybacked to include some additional data. So it's kind of like, is the acknowledgement part of the overhead, or is it just part of responding with data? It just depends. Like, I can't answer that. Nobody can answer that without actually counting the actual number of bytes that get exchanged. One optimization that we can try to do is increase the segment size. And the segment size, the MSS, or the MTU, again, those are determined by the physical layer of your network. And so one example is that uh, we can support Ethernet jumbo frames. Jumbo frames go up to 9,000 bytes, or some extensions can go even bigger. So I'll put a question mark there. This could lead to better performance. Uh, we get to put more data in a smaller number of overhead or smaller amount of overhead. Um, but since all frames take the same amount of time, if we're going to start using jumbo frames or allowing jumbo frames, then we're going to have to increase the penalty on sending small frames. And so 
that becomes a huge deal if you have a lot of small data as opposed to very large amounts of data. Um, and so to go to larger MTU sizes to get bigger MSS sizes for one application could really penalize another application and make the whole decision not good. Um, the other problem with having larger segment sizes or larger MTUs is that when there are errors and we have to resend data to overcome an error in transmission, I have to send more data. So, you know, it'd be great if I could just send a gigabyte. Like here, here's a gigabyte of data all at once. But if the receiver is like, um, of all of the billion bytes you just sent me, one of them is bad, I have to resend all billion bytes. And that's really inefficient because I'll probably have to do that like 10 times until I finally get the data to be delivered. So what we want to try to do is just kind of find the sweet spot. We want to be able to tune our network to kind of get it into the right MSS and the right MTU. Um, the defaults that you just get are pretty close. I mean, we haven't chosen 1,500 bytes just because. Um, we haven't left it at 1,500 bytes for almost 40 years just because. Um, so these defaults do get you pretty close. Um, but if you have some very specific conditions, sometimes you can make decisions that lead to better performance. Um, one example of this is uh, a number of years ago, we had a high-performance computer lab with Apple Mac Pros. They were uh, dual processor G5 machines running at 2.5 gigahertz. And for the, 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 the calendar year, that was a remarkable lab. And we were doing, I was doing a task where I needed to do some parallel processing. And so we went in and uh, tuned the Mac TCP stack to allow jumbo frames up to 100K. And we worked with um, the buffer sizes and the latency and everything. And we found that as long as we're running that one application, those large jumbo frames, uh, because our switches were all local, the data was all local, um, we got like 99.9% .9 of the theoretical maximum performance from the TCP layer. Um, and so it really made a big difference. But as soon as we were done with that, we did all of those changes and went back to normal just because for everything else, there was actually more overhead. So accessing a web browser was actually slower, noticeably slower. If you could see the, webs, the web browser struggling to pull in small chunks of data. Just depends on what you're doing. So um, tuning has a double-edged sword. You can make one part of your application faster, but make other parts slower. And, and that's just not, like, no good. So um, the TCP segment header, um, like we saw with UDP, has a number of different parts to it. And it's very hard to tell you how big it's going to be because of the options field. So options are optional. There could be zero bytes of them to some number. Um, and that number size is going to um, be determined. Um, there should be a pointer to it. I think it's this data offset. It tells you where the data begins after the options. Um, so the options can be you know, 16, 32, 50 bytes, whatever their size it is. Um, like we saw with UDP, uh, we have a source port and a destination port. And those are going to be 16-bit integers. They look and smell and act just like UDP. This is part of the multiplexing capability of TCP and UDP. What we see new is the sequence number and an acknowledgement number. The sequence number is identifying what sequence this packet is or this segment is in the communication. So if we were to look at all of the, the TCP segments that come through on one particular conversation, we would want to see the sequence number is just kind of increasing um, with successive packets. Likewise, we can have an acknowledgement number. And we're going to see that the acknowledgement number is special. It doesn't just go one, two, three, four. 
goes differently, but we'll get there. Um, there is also this thing called the window size. The window size is used to tell the remote side how much data you can hold. So back a couple slides, we had talked about how TCP has some overhead and it has some buffering. Um, we can use this window size to communicate to the remote how much buffer space I still have available. Because once that buffer space is full, I can't hold any more data without dropping it. So what we can do is we can report how much memory we can, we can buffer to the remote side. And then if the remote side sends more, like they ignore us, which they could do, we're just going to drop any new data. So one version of an attack might be, I'm going to just send you more data than what your window size says you can handle. Of course, that just means hopefully we're going to drop that data. Um, we also see the, the, the checksum that we saw with UDP. So that, they're very much like UDP. Um, the rest of the stuff is kind of strange. We have um, two different kinds of data, um, which we'll look at. There's regular data and urgent data. And then there's a pointer that tells us where the urgent data ends. Begins, ends, big, begins, begins. Um, nope, ends. Sorry, I had to think about that for a second. This is where we know where it begins. The urgent data would be the first parts of the data. So if I had data that was urgent, it would start right here. And then this urgent pointer would point to the next byte right after that. Um, there's also a... Um, set of flags here, which we'll take a look at on the next slide. So the six bits of the flags identify the different signals that we can use to exchange uh, the status of this TCP connection. So one of them we've already seen, and that's the urgent field. Urgent, if it's set to one, tells the system to pay attention to the urgent pointer, and then that tells it to deliver that data as urgent. So what this urgency means is that um, sending urgent data should be delivered ahead of any normal data. Um, there should be as little delay as possible. Um, I have some more words coming up about that, um, I think. Um, another flag that's kind of related to urgent, and in fact, um, is a common exam question that you'll see on these certification exams just to trip people up. Um, similar to urgency is push. Data that should be pushed should be pushed without any buffering. And so the idea is that as soon as the data is available from the application, it should be pushed out of the TCP um, as quickly as it can. But it gets delivered with any normal priority. The urgent tag is you are asking any endpoint between or any router between these two endpoints to deliver this urgent data with a little bit of elevated privilege, a little bit of we're trying to expedite things. It doesn't mean that the, the, the transport layers in between these two endpoints are going to pay attention to it, but we can at least ask. And if they, they honor it, then yeah, this, this could end up uh, arriving before other normal traffic. Um, the other four flags, um, ACK is an acknowledgement to data that I have sent before. So if I send to you some data before I send you more data, I want to see that you acknowledge my data, and that would be the ACK. And then we see reset synchronize, and FIN, which make up the three-way handshake that TCP uses. So SYN is what you use to start a conversation. Um, reset and FIN indicate that this is the end of a conversation. Um, we get then into the role of sequence and acknowledgement numbers. Sequence numbers are used to... Um, order the byte stream that gets exchanged between the two different devices. 
TCP uses this to say that we're going to send some number of bytes. And as we send some number of bytes, the sequence number reflects where we are in that byte stream. And what happens is we could theoretically start every sequence off at zero. And then if I send 10 bytes, the next segment was sort of, or sequence was sort of 10. And if I send 100 bytes, the next sequence would start at 110 and so on. The problem with doing that is that well-known protocols typically send sequences in the same order. And if we started everybody at zero, it'd be really easy to spoof the sequence numbers and inject data into somebody's stream. And so what we do is each communication adds a initial sequence number that is randomly selected. So instead of starting at zero, we start at some ISN number. But then when I send that first hello, can I talk to you message, that sequence number is my ISN. The acknowledgement that comes back and then the acknowledgement to the server's acknowledgement gets to be ISN plus one for the acknowledgement. And then after that, we just move byte numbers back and forth. So this is really handy because when I acknowledge, I'm going to not just acknowledge N, but I'm going to acknowledge the next byte that the receiver expects to receive. So effectively, whenever I acknowledge, I'm saying, yeah, I got all the previous 300 million bytes. So I'm ready for the, the next byte after that. So what we're really saying is an acknowledgement is really what we call a cumulative acknowledgement. Um, I theoretically don't have to acknowledge every single packet. Um, we can acknowledge the last packet along the way. Um, and to make matters even better, um, acknowledgement packets, we go back to the header slide here just a second. If I set the acknowledgement packet, I can add my acknowledgement number here and I can put some data into the data message. And so an acknowledgement can actually piggyback and send data back from the server to the client or vice versa. So when you're looking at a trace, you might see client and server. Client sends a request. Server sends an acknowledgement plus data. And if there's no more data to exchange, client might just send an ACK with no additional data. Or the client could send an ACK plus more data. And that just goes on and on and on until the connection is finally finished. So this really uh, reduces the overhead of TCPs acknowledging everything. Um, and, and it's a really great idea. So TCP is going to generate an acknowledgement for the following five reasons. The first one is uh, the arrival of an in-order segment with the expected sequence number and all of the data up to the expected sequence number is already acknowledged. And so what this is, is essentially the normal arrival of a segment. Like, hey, that's the data I was expecting. Everything is running smooth. And what TCP is going to do is it's going to do this thing called a delayed ACK. And in a delayed ACK, we're going to wait up to 500 milliseconds. I don't have to wait at all, but we're going to wait up to 500 milliseconds for arrival of more in-order segments. And finally, like, so let's say that you sent five packets and they all come in in one big burst. Instead of me responding with five different acknowledgements, one of which might get lost and then trigger all kinds of retransmissions, if they all arrive within this 500 milliseconds, I'm going to acknowledge all of them with one acknowledgement. I'm going to say, oh, thankfully, I got all of that data I'm ready for more. Um, if the next in-order segment doesn't arrive in that time interval or, you know, we get to here and then for something happened and we didn't get that one, then we'll acknowledge this group and I'll acknowledge that group. Um, so again, this delayed act, the time can be set by every operating system to be less than 500 milliseconds. Um, but 500 milliseconds is what the standard max or this, the maximum that the standard allows. 
The other one we can do is the arrival of in order segment with the expected sequence number, um, but we're still waiting for a, another in order segment um, to be act. And so in this case, what we'll do is we will, and so basically we were stuck here, something happened, we didn't send out the act, and now the next one came in, so now we can acknowledge both of these. Again, it's kind of related to the delayed act. Um, arrival of an out of order segment with a higher than expected sequence number. In other words, um, the last one that I got was some part of the file. We skipped a bunch of space and I don't know what's in between. And so in this case, what I've got to do is send a duplicate act for this data. So I'm going to act this twice. What this is saying is this is the data that I got last. Um, and so we're going to indicate the sequence number of the next expected byte, which is right there. Um, and so it's the lower end of the gap. And now the transmitter is going to be like, uh, OK, so I will resend this. And then hopefully we can act that. And then we'll resend the next thing. And then since I already have this, Um, so if we, um, get the arrival of a segment that partially fills in the gap. So like we said here, we were waiting for this thing to be filled in, but we got something in the middle. Um, we can then immediately send the act and provide the segment start here again. So we're always going to try to fill in this missing region first before we try to fill in that region. Um, if we have an arrival of stream segments back to back, but the, uh, one of the segments is lost uh, somewhere, um, and we know that it's been lost. So for instance, we got a couple of stream segments coming in right on top of another. Maybe this one failed checksum. So I know that it's bad data. I don't need to time out. I don't want to time out. I want to get this as fast as possible. So what we'll, we're going to do is do what's called the fast retransmit. And the fast retransmit says that I can do three acknowledgments of that address back to back. So I just send those three and immediately the sender is like, oh, you need that chunk of data one more time. Fantastic. So I'll send that to you. And then hopefully the, the second time it gets sent, it won't have any transmission errors in it. One example of how this works is the one of the simplest protocols ever developed for the internet called Telnet. And Telnet predates SSH. And Telnet had absolutely zero security in it. And because Telnet was trying to emulate a terminal, um, it was really trying to emulate a serial terminal. If you, as the user, type a character, that character gets sent as one TCP message. So let's see what they're trying to show here. So the user types the letter C, and that gets sent out over the wire and it gets sent as sequence number 42. And in sequence number 42, we're acknowledging some previous transmission here. And we're saying that there's some data in the packet. And it's a C. Now, if you've ever used a serial terminal, you know that if I type a letter, it doesn't have to get echoed back. And in fact, if you've ever logged in to Sloop over SSH and you've had to type in your password, you know that when you type in your password, it doesn't show up on the screen. And that's because the terminal driver on Sloop has turned off that echo back. So if echo is turned on, then the host is not only going to acknowledge that it got this data. So 
it's going to acknowledge that the last byte it receives successfully, or sorry, it's going to acknowledge the next byte it expects to be 43. So presumably, um, whatever our ISN was, our ISN plus one plus some number of bytes before this added up to 42, and now we're at 43. But we're also going to exchange and send data 79, which says to the host, here's a character back. So it's just confusing here that they're saying um, we're acknowledging C and the sending C. It's just that the serial terminal is trying to echo back whatever the user typed in. So the host is going to have to acknowledge the receipt of that. And it does so by saying, look, I've got or I expect my next character to be data 43, and I'm acknowledging number uh, number 80. I'm acknowledging one byte beyond the character that I've just received. So this is what the Telnet protocol would do when you typed a single character. I want to re remind you that at the very lowest level, this is going to turn into one 1,500-byte frame uh, on Ethernet. This is another 1,500-byte frame. This is another 1500 byte frame for a total of 400 or 4,500 bytes on Ethernet 2. And I'll be honest with you, when I first got into this business, fast Ethernet 2 ran at 10 megabits per second. And so when you think about how much one user typing a character over a Telnet session was over Ethernet 2. It was actually quite a lot. And to make matters worse, back when I first got into it, this was for everybody. So, for instance, the office that I worked in, we had about 35 people in the um, contracting and administrative offices. And they all Telneted into the server that I ran. And so you can imagine how much network performance kind of sucked <laughs> just from supporting Telnet sessions. Um, sadly, SSH still has to do the same thing just because you need to be able to type something and get a response back. Um, but it's encrypted, so it's actually more data. Woohoo! Go SSH. Now, um, one of the challenges to TCP is that we need to figure out when do we wait, or when do we stop waiting for an acknowledgement packet? Because when I want to request a uh, retransmit, I need to be able to trigger that resend event, but I don't want to do it too soon, because if I do it too soon, I'm going to prematurely ask for a resend, and then I'm going to end up with two copies of the data, and I'm going to be wasting some network resources. On the flip side, if I wait too long, then the user is going to start perceiving slow down in the network when the network is actually idle. I'm just waiting forever for a retransmit. So what we want to be able to do is kind of dynamically figure out through an algorithm what a good read time or a timeout is. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to base it on this thing called the round trip time or the RTT. And the RTT um, is going to basically tell us how long, on average, does it take for a packet to go from me to you and back again. So TCP uses a really simple strategy. I remember when I sent the packet, and I can tell you when the ACK came in, and I can measure the time delta between those two things, and that is the round trip time. So all we've got to do is, before I finish sending the packet, put a timestamp on it and say, started now, act comes in, and the timer. But we don't want to do this for every single transmit just because it's going to um, be noisy uh, and kind of inefficient. So if you remember back from the, the last part when we looked at um, the go back in and the selective um, uh, retransmit algorithms. The idea was that there was a little burstiness to those. You would have a bunch of packets in the flight at one time. 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to call one of those a burst. We're going to say, you know, if we're sent, if we've sent out eight packets at one time, we're going to take the average of the round trip time that came back as the actual time for this burst. But we don't want to use that as the sole update for the average round tip time. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a little data science. We're going to try to um, smooth out any noise in the data. So just as an example, Google maintains pretty tight networking throughout the country. And so I took the round trip times that I got from my computer to Google and just kind of measured them out. And the average was right about 30 and plus or minus one standard deviation. Um, the standard deviation was uh, 2.5 milliseconds. Actually, I think this graph goes out to standard deviations. Um, the, the variance here was really, really small. But if there was a, a one transient issue, I wouldn't want that one transient packet to completely disrupt my estimate of the round trip time that I've, I've had and enjoyed between myself and Google. So we could do a running average. So we could say maybe take an average of the last uh, five round trip times. So the first five were like 30, 30, 30, 29, and 100. Something bad happened there. So by averaging this out, so this would be 60, 90, um, 119, 219, divide that by five, and so that's going to be 43. So not quite the 100, but it's better than saying 30, right? So I could estimate the next round trip time should be 43. Um, we could also do um, a weighted average um, or even look at the geometric mean. Um, but the way that we found that works the best is this thing called the exponential moving average or the EWA. And the textbook does a really weird explanation of this. So the exponential moving average in the Briggs definition, um, unfortunately looks a little scary. It's a recursive function. And we, uh, we have an estimate here called tau. Tau is what I'm gonna forecast to be the next round trip time. And initially we're gonna pick some initial round trip value, five. Whatever number you wanna do, make a random number. And then that's what we're gonna use as our guess, tau. Then when we get our, our first actual round trip time, I want to revise my guess as the exponential moving average. And what we do is we use some value alpha and we multiply that by the actual time. And then we add one minus alpha times the previous estimate. So let's say, for example, alpha is close to, as alpha goes down to zero, then what's going to happen is I'm not going to pay any attention to the actual value because it's, I'm basically saying it's zero. And as alpha goes to zero, then that means I'm going to put 100%, almost 100% of my weight on my previous estimate, which means I'm never going to move off of my previous estimate. At the other extreme, if we say that alpha goes to one, which is the, the maximum value that it can be, then I'm going to be really hyper focused on what the last round trip time was. And I'm not going to have any smoothing based on the previous estimates of where we are. And so um, you can kind of think of this as very far-sighted here, meaning it's going to take a long time for any changes to the round trip time estimate based on changes in the round trip time. And here we're going to be very short-sighted 
where I'm going to make immediate changes to my estimate based on the most recent time. And we want to be able to kind of be somewhere in between. So let's fill in some, some simple numbers here. Um, let's say that our alpha is um, one quarter and our tau sub zero is one. So my first estimate according to this function is tau sub zero is one. So I forecast that our round trip time should be one. Now we send some data, we get some results back and it turns out that T of zero, sorry, let me make that clear to be T. T of zero is five. So what we're gonna do is when I go to calculate the next estimate, I'm gonna calculate tau sub one is equal to one quarter times five plus three quarters times our previous estimate. And then we're gonna add those together. Um, and so you have five quarters plus three quarters equals eight quarters or two. So our next estimate is gonna be two. So let me change colors here. So tau sub two is going to, so anyway, so we're gonna guess that the next round tip, trip time should be two. So we make that guess, we actually get a next round trip time for the, the next time. We find that it's still five. So if it's one fourth times five plus three fourths times two, so that was our previous estimate. See, previous estimate. So in this case, I have um, six eighths plus five fourths or 10 eighths, and that's 16 eighths. I think I did that wrong. Why did I do that as eighths? I have five fourths plus six fourths um, is 11 fourths. Um, and let four goes into 11, two and three fourths. So there's my next estimate. So anyway, I'm not gonna keep on going, but that's just how you keep revising this. So even though it's defined recursively, you would never do like 100 iterations of this recursion. We're just saying we're going to remember. So this recursion is just say, remember the last estimate. And then use that to calculate the next estimate. So that's all it really is doing. And what I've got here is an, kind of a randomly generated set of data. This is the actual time. And you see it's really super noisy. And I don't want to necessarily have that much noise in my estimates. I might want to have the estimates kind of converge on there, but not like really converge on there. So what I've got are three different versions of predictions based on different alpha values. So for instance, the first guy in orange, alpha 0.5. So we see here that the, the kind of wide, wildly changing times lead to somewhat noisy and high variance um, output uh, estimates. But going down to point one, we see that we are, we're getting the rough shape of our graph, but it's a lot smoother. And so we're not gonna see wild changes. We're gonna see more incremental changes, but eventually we'll get as close to what the actual values and on the other hand, we could also have alpha so small, um, eventually it will, it will really get to up here. It's just gonna take a long time because we're not paying hardly any attention at all to the actual time. We're, we're kind of really focused on kind of lock, we've dug our heels in and we're like, man, I know this estimate is right. 
I know I've been wrong the last 50 times, but I know I'm really right. Um, and we're, gonna, we're not going to want to change our, our opinion. So this exponential function is a really common thing. It's not just used here. It's just used very well here. Um, and we can actually look at the accuracy of these predictors. So what, one of the things that we can do is we can take the accuracy of some values. So if this is the actual, then I can use like the rolling average of three values. So six and four and five is 15 divided by three. Four and five is nine plus seven is 16 divided by three is 5.3. Um, and so that's the moving average of three. This is the geometric mean, and then these are the three uh, exponential averages. And the way that we can compute the kind of net gross error of a predictor is this thing called the root mean squared error. Root mean squared error. Sometimes you'll see it just abbreviated like that. And we actually get to see root mean squared error all over the place. For instance, if you are in doing a, um, if you're an electrician, and 